Hi there, ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls. We have a tremendous wrestling card for you today here on All-Star Championship Wrestling, which, of course, features the world's greatest wrestlers. My little itty-bitty bruiser buddies. United States Heavyweight Champion from Brazil. The world's heavyweight champion from the AWA, Nick Pockwinkle. The Midwest supporting, bruiser loving, positivity spreading, world's most dangerous podcast. Join former pro wrestler and promoter Dave Dynasty as he supports and promotes Midwest pro wrestling. Keep on growing with the Midwest Express. This is the Dave Dynasty Show. Greetings and welcome to the Dave Dynasty Show. I am your host, Dave Dynasty. Thank you for joining us this week for another episode. We're back in the new year, 2019. We took a week off uh, because of all the craziness with the holidays, uh, lots of craziness going on at home, but we are back and we have a great show for you. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things we want to do here to start off the show. Uh, remember, you can see me making my return to ring announcing. For Forever Pro Wrestling's debut event in Scottsburg, Indiana on Friday, January 25th. The doors open at 6 p.m. with a bell time of 7. Uh, also on the show, you can see Chris Caliber, Levi Everett, uh, Custom Made, and much, much more. Do not miss that event. Uh, go to my Facebook page. You can see links for that event. Again, that is Forever Pro Wrestling's debut event, Scottsburg, Indiana, Friday, January 25th. Come see me and say hello. While you're out and about, uh, make sure you also go check out an event coming up. Uh, on April 27th in Dalton, Ohio, the event is called Dylan the Destroyer's Autism Awareness Fundraiser. This is a very, very cool event for a very, very good cause. Uh, it's held in Northeast Ohio. All the proceeds go to the Northeast Ohio Autism Group. And uh, it's not really a wrestling show. It's kind of a convention. There'll be Q&A sessions with stars uh, and all kinds of things and meet and greets. Uh, Bob Roop will be there. Uh, the One Man Gang uh, Demolition so much more, a very, very cool event for a very, very good cause. Again, that is April 27th in Dalton, Ohio. The event is called Dylan the Destroyer's Autism Awareness Fundraiser. Go on Facebook, look up the event for more information. Make sure you are there for that event. Um, we got a good show for you today. Uh, here in a little bit, we're going to have this great interview with Austin Tyler Morris. Uh, ATM is one of the greatest young talents going uh, in all of wrestling, in my opinion, uh, definitely going to be a star to come out of the Midwest. He's definitely on the rise. Uh, if you have events, if you are a promoter, if you're holding a show, uh, get hold of Austin Tyler Morris, book him on your event. I, I cannot recommend him enough. But we got a great interview coming up later in the show with him. But first, in this past uh, week on January 2nd, uh, the world lost uh, Gene Oakland, longtime wrestling uh, broadcaster. And here joining me to talk about Gene uh, is Minnesota native and wrestling historian and author uh, George Shire. George, how you doing? Very good, Dave. Nice to be on with you. Wish it were better circumstances. Yeah, me too. Um, so talk to me a little about Gene, because uh, Gene got his start uh, there in Minnesota, uh, you know, a couple, a few decades ago. So tell us about uh, how Gene got started in the wrestling business. Well, and it's been more than a few decades, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, just to give you a little brief uh, pre-Gene Okerlund history, uh, the AWA that started in 1960 and even dating back to the very early 50s when uh, the NWA still was ruling in Minneapolis, we, uh, we basically had one wrestling announcer, and that was Marty O'Neill who was a St. Paul native, St. Paul, Minnesota native. He was a, uh, a very popular sports figure. He played baseball. He was a uh, avid sports fan. He was on the local radio stations here in the Twin Cities and uh, even did some Minnesota Twins baseball commentary with uh, Herb Carneal in the early 60s when the Twins came here to Minnesota. So a very noted individual, and Marty was very well received, very liked, uh, very good personality for wrestling, and um, so he he was our announcer up until about 1973. And the wrestling matches at that time uh, for television 
in the Twin Cities were taped at the old WTCN TV uh, Channel 11 studios in Minneapolis. And, of course, Marty was the uh, perennial host of that show. Well, on one particular night or one particular day, and what they used to do in that era was they would have a day of taping interviews if the show was not live. And a lot of times the show was also live. So on one particular day in 1973, there is a broadcaster's union strike of some sort going on that Marty O'Neill belonged to. And um, he was unable to cross the picket line to go in and, of course, do his broadcasting job. Uh, some people said he didn't want to cross the line. Others said he couldn't. doesn't matter which story is really accurate. The end result is he did not uh, cross that line. And uh, and Marty O'Neill, or Bern Gagne, of course, is uh, in a frenzy to get his uh, AWA show interviews taped and do the, do the program. So he went to a marketing director at WTCN-TV by the name of Gene Okerlund and asked him if he could handle the announcing duties for that night. That was how Gene Okerlund got his start with the AWA. Yeah, and uh, so what, I know he filled in for Marty on and off and then ended up taking the role. How was he How was he received? Because like you said, Marty was such an institution there uh, in Minnesota and with the AWA. When, when Gene came in, how, how did the fans receive him uh, following Marty? Well, well, and you know, it's interesting, Dave, because anytime there's a, uh, someone that replaces a very popular figure. And I mean, this could go to anybody. If you've had a great boss at your employer and, and then a new person comes in and takes over, you know, it's always hard for that new person to gain immediate acceptance because they're replacing somebody that was loved and well-liked. Um, and that was, strangely enough, that was kind of the feeling when Gene first took over. When he took over, after Marty was unable to come back on a full-time basis due to health reasons. After that strike ended, Marty was back in the position, and of course Gene was you know, just a, an afterthought at that point. But it wasn't too many months later that Marty started having some health problems, and it got harder and harder for him to do the show. And as we all know now, Gene was given the role permanently. And initially, that turned out okay because fans were accepting that Marty was sick and that Gene was filling in. And it seemed at the beginning that that would still be the case. So to say he was 100% accepted in the role by probably the vast majority of the fans, he, he didn't have that immediate uh, appeal. But... Eventually, we were informed, and it just happened that Marty didn't return, and uh, Gene Okerlund became the, the regular face, and, and by that time, he'd already worked his way into it, and the fans started to take to him. The one thing that was very different about Marty and Gene is that Marty was more, both of them so well at what they did with the microphone, and but Marty was different because he was more... I guess I would say more of a straight man in that he didn't respond to the wrestlers when they were barking at him or, or you know, spewing off about their upcoming match or opponent. Marty would deliver the line to them, let the fans know where the match was the night it was going to be held, inform the fans where to get tickets, and, you know, advertise or talk other things on TV that was going on with wrestling. Gene Okerlund, though, he, he really kind of changed that because he would get on, and when one of the wrestlers, usually a heel, was sort of ranting and raving, Gene would kind of roll his eyebrows, or he'd look at the camera and kind of shake his head just a little bit, or make some comment like, Ah, uh, come on now. That that's not necessary, you know that sort of thing. And the wrestler in return would maybe say, "Hey, you don't know what you're talking about. Be quiet," or something. 
as he evolved into the to the role, he became even more animated, more accepted by the fans. And the interesting thing is, Dave, is that th- now we're moving towards the end of the 70s. And wrestling by its very nature was becoming a little different in how it was presented. And as we got into the 80s, the early 80s, of course, it started to change even a little bit more with more over-the-top type characters. And Gene just played so well in that role. Mm -hmm. And when he had guys like, eventually, uh, Mad Dog Vashon, of course, and uh, Jesse Ventura, you know, and I would point out to you that it was Jesse that gave Gene the mean Gene name. Right. And that happened during an interview on uh, television one time when uh, Jesse actually said something to the effect to him that, uh, mean Gene, the hot air machine, <laughs> and went about doing the rest of his interview. Well, that hot air machine part left. That, that was never mentioned again, but he did become mean Gene. And, you know, any of us, who have ever went to YouTube or, or watched videos after the fact, now you hear somebody like Jesse say, you know, let me tell you something, mean Gene. Mm-hmm. And it just became who he was. But Gene was very popular. He, um, he, would, he would stand up to the wrestlers and he would he really give them some feedback, but yet he was very professional in his delivery. And he had a broadcasting background, as did Marty O'Neill, because Gene had been on local Twin Cities radio before he ever got into the uh, uh, the marketing area at the at the TV station. He was on a local radio station, WDGY, which was a top forty station in the '60s, and he had a three hour stint every day on the air. And he went under the name of Gene Leader while he was on the air. So he was. No one in the Twin Cities. At the time, though, when he came on wrestling, there were a lot of people that had realized that that was Gene Leader from the radio right. because he had used a different name. Yeah, but he was a known commodity. Yeah, and, I mean, he became and he became known for, like you said, that that uh, interaction with the wrestlers, and, and and he was very, very talented in leading promos. And uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the hit the AWA took. Uh, when Vince started taking, you know, signing away talent, and particularly, you know, like Hulk Hogan and some of these things, I think a strong argument could be made uh, that one of the biggest impacts was was the signing away of Gene Okerlund uh, from the AWA. Um, I don't think, you know, that suddenly that kind of the face of the company was kind of gone there uh, for the people. Well, and it was a very confusing time too, because and there's a couple of things that at the time, you know, the average wrestling fan in 1984 when the promotional national expansion war started, you know, if you look at the territorial system in the 80s, the early 80s, 1981, 1982, just about every territory around the country, for whatever reason, was having uh, just a booming success with attendance and drawing well with their, with their wrestlers. The AWA was no exception. And in fact, 1981 and 82 were their highest grossing years. Right. Okay. And it was so big in part because obviously we had Hulk Hogan, but I I will tell you, and I've said this to people, I said, you know, Hulk Hogan was a huge part of it, but we had a whole, me as a fan, Dave, I had been going to matches since the, the very late 1950s. And the, the fan base had changed overall. It was a younger audience that was starting to attend wrestling. And I don't know why they all hung on or, you know, found the jumped on the bad bandwagon, shall we say, but it was a younger audience and Hulk Hogan appealed to them. We had uh, guys like the Sheik Adnan Casey. We had Jerry Blackwell. We had Jesse Ventura. We had Dr. D. David Schultz. We had Nick Bockwinkel and Bobby Heenan, who were absolutely over as anyone could be. And then, yes, you had a a great personality on the microphone. And all of a sudden, when that 
that uh, first bullet was fired from Vince McMahon. And, then, you know, in hindsight, I, I don't have any problem with McMahon and his expansion. It's all in the past. Everything happened the way it happened. I don't get into that anymore. Yeah. But at the time, there, there is no doubt that Vince McMahon realized one thing. In order for him to attempt to go national, he realized that Hulk Hogan was the, exi- the perfect person to be the poster child for his national move and what fans in AWA know Hulk Hogan Hulkamania was all created by Vern Gagne right and the AWA wrestlers that worked and molded Hulk Hogan because I can tell you you go back to 1980 when Hulk Hogan first came here to the AWA he was he was as green as can be on the, on the microphone. And it was the, it was the first intent when he came as Vern brought him in to be a heel. You know, here's this big guy. And, you know, I guess the mentality may have been that, you know, you're a big guy, so you can be a bully type. Right. Yeah. And arrogant because you had the long blonde hair and, you know, play that sort of a role. So his intent was to be a heel, but he couldn't talk a lick Mm. on the, on the microphone. And Vern put him with luscious Johnny Valiant, who anybody who ever saw the Valiant brothers uh, during the 70s, their interviews were not only hilarious, but they were they were creative. They were great. Right. They were both good talkers. Yeah. So Johnny Valiant played a good mouthpiece for him and Hulk didn't have to say a word. He would stand in front of Mean Gene with his back to the camera while Johnny Valiant uh, talked all his virtues and that went on for a very short time because when Hulk would appear in the live events, for whatever reason, that younger audience, they were cheering him instead of booing him. And so eventually like real quick, Vern switched gears. Johnny Valiant was gone. Hulk Hogan was our new, uh, being groomed to be the, the top baby face. And if you listen to some of his very earliest interviews, you hear more of Terry Bollier than you do Hulk Hogan because that Hogan character had not fully uh, escaped yet. Yeah. But he caught on quick. He worked with guys like Bobby Heenan, he, you know, who he became very good friends with. I mean, behind the scenes, they were good friends on the, on the camera. They were mortal enemies in the <laughs> AWA, but Hulk, Hulk learned. And so he was the poster child, but here's what happened in 84. Vince McMahon decided I'm going to go national. Hogan's the guy I need. When he took Hogan, Hogan wanted mean gene to come with him. Right. And what was interesting about that is because Gene and, and Hulk really worked well together on the microphone. And ironically, McMahon didn't question that because Gene Okerlund was the perfect announcer for the type of promotion that uh, Vince McMahon was giving the fans at, at that time. You know, the it, it was more flamboyant. It was more colorful. It was more uh, character than substance shall we say and gene was the perfect one so gene went with him now when you talk about how fans accepted that it was very confusing because in those days they would tape on a on a given day they would tape three or four sometimes five weeks of wrestling interviews for various towns where matches were going to be taking place so in other words they're doing something four weeks from now and they're advertising a card and there's cutting interviews for it with all of the wrestlers. And then those tapes would be sent out to the various AWA cities, the TV stations, to be aired. So when Gene Okerlund leaves, there's already, for lack of a better purpose, let's just say a month's worth of wrestling tapes that are out there. 
advertising upcoming cards. And fans on the AWA TV, they're looking at it and they're seeing Gene promoting these matches. But at the very same time, Vince McMahon invaded the Twin Cities and some of the other AWA markets and had his own WWF TV show on the air. And they're seeing Mean Gene on there as well, claiming that he's now with the Big Apple, with the real world champion, Hulk Hogan. And then they would turn to the AWA and see Gene. So that was kind of strange. And there were fans that even thought it was all the same promotion. <laughs> you know, like, not really paying that close attention. Yeah. Then we started seeing Ken Resnick, who had been the replacement for Gene, to come on AWA, and we would see Ken Resnick, and now we saw Gene only on WWF. Yeah. And that be and and now and I felt bad for Ken Resnick at that time because, again, he was put into a position where he was replacing a very popular and a, and a very talented person, and he didn't get the the kudos that he deserved or the chances to be accepted because people took it as, you know, it's not important. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you mentioned Bobby Heenan and uh, it, it's remarkable how much Gene and Bobby's careers overlap through the WWF, WCW, but all that chemistry and, and that interaction started there in the AWA. What, what were those two like in those early times uh, when they were first interacting, like you said, with Heenan as the manager of the Heenan family with Bach Winkle and, and, and Bobby Duncombe and so on? Well, what was unique about that era, and I, I talked to um, you know some of the fans that follow wrestling for the past 30 years, you know, being WWE version, and they don't realize that back in that era we did have live TV and we did have the taped shows with interviews and that sort of thing, but the most important thing is that there was never a single wrestler or announcer, and Gene, of course, included in this, that had any type of a script right. when they went on the air. So Gene Oakland, using him as the example, he was there to push the upcoming event in a town in the AWA, and he had the date and the, the local arena, the venue it was going to be at, and he had the matches. And when those wrestlers would come into the interview area, Gene, ad-living, would throw out whatever question or comment or, you know, concern that he had. And then the wrestlers, and this is something that uh, a fan, an old fan like me, totally misses, is that the guys like Nick Bockwinkle and Ray Stevens and Bobby Duncombe and Larry Hennig and Mad Dog and Crusher and you can go just continue and all other wrestlers around the country as well in their respective territories. They ad libbed their interviews mm -hmm. and they got themselves over in the two minutes or three minutes that they were given during their interview time on a, on a wrestling TV program. And they did it without cue cards. They did it without notes, without memorizing. And, of course, we know that that is totally changed to today's product where all of the guys on TV are they're required to uh, actually memorize 20 minutes worth of uh, uh, interview stuff. Yeah. And it's all written by writers. So it was a totally different product, and Gene was good at playing off of the wrestlers. You know, when, when he would say, I mean, he, he was so good at it with his facial expressions. And he'd say, oh, come on now, Hulk, you're telling me that you want to take on the Sheik and Jerry Blackwell by yourself? And, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And then Hogan would run with, with the interview, you know. Yeah. And um, he was so good when, when Jesse Ventura would come out and, you know, he'd say that Jesse would say that he just spent the night with uh, the Rolling Stones, mm -hmm. and Jesse would go, oh, "Come on," or uh, Gene would go, oh, "Come on now, Jesse." <laughs> you know, and he just did it so well, and so that became part of the entertainment. Yeah, and you you really you really loved that character. 
So, and when he went to the WWF, he, um, you know, we saw him in various roles. We saw him announcing. We saw him doing ringside commentary. We saw him in a lot of the little skits and uh, things they did. But he was a very talented guy. The one thing I've told a couple people in the last few days when I've been talking, uh, you know, the local media here in Minneapolis has done a, a really good job of covering Gene because he became a national figure, you know, going to the WWE. Mm-hmm. But um, I've told him that, you know, Gene, there, you could never say that he wasn't talented. You could never say that he didn't have charisma and he was charismatic to, to beat all. But I do know, and Gene himself did admit this in the past, and that is that two times in his career, he was in the right place at the right time. The first time was when Marty O'Neill was unable to cross the picket line. And out of the blue, he's given the job as a wrestling announcer. And Gene, by his own admission, did not know anything about wrestling. He didn't follow wrestling. He was just a marketing person for the, for the TV station. And, but, but he had the, the gift of gab and he had the, the broadcasting experience, but he was in the right place at the right time. And then, The second time when he's in that position was when uh, Vince McMahon goes national. And, of course, he gets the call to go and and be the person on the big stage. And, again, good talent certainly deserved the break, but it's all, you know, life is a lot of time about breaks, just being there when you're in the right spot. Yep. Yeah, and, yeah, Gene, I mean, he was... He was obviously the, he's perfectly built for wrestling, right? I mean, he as you said, he had uh, you know the the ability to talk. He had that uh, that outgoing personality, liked to sing, uh, had the the marketing sales background, had the the broadcast background, and was just uh, by all accounts, everybody says, just was an enjoyable guy to be around. And uh, you, you don't hear necessarily bad things about Gene. And it's it's obviously you know him leaving is a big hole. It's a it's you know a missing link now uh, to the past as we lose you know another guy from that era. Uh, of Midwest wrestling, you know, from back in th- that day, what do you think the, the the legacy of Gene Oakland will be? I mean, everybody thinks of the stuff in the WWF, but there was so much more before that uh, that I, I hope will not be forgotten. Um, you know, over the years, and, and he won't just get pigeonholed as 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 the guy that stood by Hogan in the WWF. Well, you know, I, I think. It all comes down to breaking it down into different eras, maybe different age groups. You know, obviously there are going to be those fans that when they hear when they heard the other day that Gene had passed, um, you know, if they've been a wrestling fan for the past 10 or 20, 30 years. I was just talking with my wife a little bit ago, and I said, do you realize that it's been um, 1984 was when Hogan left the AWA? And I mean, so we're talking already 35 years, mm-hmm. and it was right around this time of the year when this happened. It was over Christmas and into the new year, right, yeah. into '84, and so we're talking we're talking 35 years that that happened. Well, a lot of those people that weren't fans back then, they're not going to remember any of that AWA legacy. They're not going to know Gene Okerlund, the the uh, radio DJ. They're not going to know that at one time while he was in his DJ years or even a little bit before that he had recorded, he had actually recorded some records. Sure. Yeah. He was going under the name of, of Gene Carroll mm-hmm. and he had, he had some, some record releases. And of course we knew he had a good voice because we heard him on WWE well, it was WWF at the time, mm-hmm. but he was, he was on one of their wrestling albums when he sang, uh, yeah. What is it, Caramia? Is that the name of the song? Um, I don't know. I thought he did he not Caramia? I, yeah, but I think I, did he not do Two D Ferdy? Maybe I thought he did. Oh yes, no, yeah. no, Caramia was the, Nikolai, Nikolai. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Okay, yeah. glad I had my eraser handy. <laughs> uh, yeah, he did Two D Fruity, and and he did a great job of it. Sure, yeah. So I mean, each era is going to remember uh, their Gene Okerlund. Right. And of course, you know, wrestling by its very nature, Dave, ever since the 50s when I first discovered it, wrestling was a very, uh, for, for, for average wrestling fans, 
it, it was a very uh, cyclical thing. Mm -hmm. Fans would jump on the bandwagon for wrestling, and they might they might follow it for uh, six months or a year, and then life gets in the way, and they no longer go to the matches, or you know they grew out of it, whatever the feud or whatever they were following, or the guy they were the you know fans of left the territory, mm -hmm. and they never follow it again. Then there's that select few people who are crazy like me <laughs> who never missed a card and, and went to different territories and, and, and got to know the wrestlers and got to be around the business and, you know, got to announce and got to write and do stories. And, and you know, so me, I remember the total package, mm -hmm. Gene Okerlund. Yep. And what he leaves, in my opinion, is that now when you talk – the history of wrestling, you, you have to, for, for Gene Okerlund, you have to say, and, and his own career, you have to say he, he just, through the decades, not only did he reinvent himself as time went on, but he got the breaks that certainly he deserved. Sure. But again, we always say if he wasn't there at that time, someone else would have got that gig. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it could have, and and then we all know history could have been rewritten differently. Sure, yeah, yeah, and unfor I mean, unfortunately, now it's uh, you know the WWE controls the history. I mean, they they have the video vaults. They are they're the ones that everybody sees. So uh, it's important, and I and I appreciate you, George, coming on and telling the stories. Uh, they, they obviously the WWE is not going to promote. You know, they're not going to talk about that era of Gene as much. So so we appreciate you coming on and helping us remember Gene and uh, and talking to us. Uh, you know, particularly about his his days in the AWA. And, uh, I mean, that, well, that was obviously key in, in him developing and him, you know, getting to that role he got to. Well, and, you know, you look at Hulk Hogan, too, being in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. You know, Hogan was in the WWF and he, when he, when he was just a rookie mm -hmm. and they didn't know what the heck to do with him. And he was basically going around from territory to territory, trying to find a niche in wrestling. Yep. Um, you can look at some results. He had different names. He was Terry Boulder. He was uh, Sterling Golden. And uh, he was going to, you know, I, I think he'd have probably floated from the business. Mm -hmm. But he came to Vern Gagne. And, and this is something that when you talk about any type of history, um, and I've said this for years, there, there were about two or three guys in the wrestling business during the 50s, well, even from the late 40s. Uh, into the early 80s that were responsible for probably about 90% of the talent that came into the business. Primary amongst those three, two or three guys was Vern Gagne. Sure, yeah. He trained, uh, he trained so many guys for the pro business, and every one of them, with but the rarest exception, made big money and became a, a megastar in the business. You know, and one time... Well, I don't know, about three, four years ago, Greg Gagne and I were sitting and we were talking about all the guys that Vern had, had trained. We were writing them down, and we, we were over 150 guys that he had <laughs> lended his, his expertise to. And, you know, when you say, holy cow, 150 guys, well, I can't, I can't come up with that many. Well, I tell you what, you look at the piece of paper, and then you look at the names on the list, and you say, wow, I didn't realize that Vern trained him, or I didn't know that. Yep. We think of the logical ones like Greg himself and, mm -hmm. and Jim Brunzel and, and uh, Larry Hennig and Baron Von Raschke, but there are you know so many guys. Mm -hmm. Hogan now is definitely in that list because Vern and the guys that worked around Vern taught Hogan how to talk, how to work in the ring, how to take the direction, how to, how to give the match and, ta and carry the match. And when he went to when he went to Vince, Vince had a ready made product. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then when you talked about rewriting history, um, Vince McMahon has always. And but let's let me say I give every promoter this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wrestling by its nature, every promoter only wanted fans to remember what they wanted you to remember. And many times the promoters or the promotions themselves didn't remember what they had done. Sure. So they would contradict what they were doing or saying. So a lot of people say, well, Vince rewrites history. 
No, he isn't really. He does, but he isn't really doing anything different than oh, his sure. predecessor. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Memphis was notorious for it. I mean, they would. Yeah. The whole you know Jerry Lawler, the quest for the title, he'd bring in guys and wouldn't necessarily defeat them, but you know the edit on TV made it look like <laughs> Lawler did. So yeah, it's. I mean, that's notorious out through history. You're correct. That's 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 true. <laughs> but it is true that you know for the first oh, maybe ten years of the WWF when when they were still WWF that when Vince was raiding the territories and the territories were falling by the wayside, that any guy that came into Vince's territory, and now the fans were seeing them on a national basis, Vince created their own histories and, and failed to recognize any of their past accomplishments. Yes, right. I mean, look what he did with Dusty Rhodes. Mm -hmm. and, and look what he did, Harley Race. You, know, mm -hmm. you take away the greatness of Harley Race and what he accomplished, but when he went to the WWF, he was never even mentioned of his past, and, and Vince just made him a king. Yep, right. I mean, so, but he never had any mention of his past. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was normal. And, I mean, it's just, it's wrestling. Yep, sure is. Well, George, thank you for coming on and talking with us again. And, uh, You've been on before, and hopefully we'll we'll have you on many, many more times uh, this year uh, talking different things. But uh, thanks for coming on and, and helping us remember Gene uh, and his legacy and, and his time in the AWA. Very good. I always appreciate coming on and continued success with your show, Dave. You do a great job. Oh, well, thank you, George. I appreciate that. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we have an interview with Austin Tyler Morris, so let's stick around. If you are looking for the best books, DVDs and posters on classic wrestling nostalgia, then you want to visit crowbarpress.com. There are literally dozens of titles there, including biographies of the likes of Bruiser Brody, Ole Anderson, Ivan Koloff, and of course, Dick the Bruiser, as we have spoke about here on the Dave Dynasty Show. You want to visit crowbarpress.com for all of your classic wrestling nostalgia needs. Again, that is crowbarpress.com. Dot com. And welcome back to the Dave Dynasty Show. I am your co-host, Ike Isaacson, today. I am joined with yet again another amazing young talent. We have Austin Tyler Morris. How are we doing today? Quite wonderful. Sitting in my humble abode. How about yourself? Uh, exact same. Sitting in my humble abode at 1045 at night, doing an interview. Wonderful time. Hi, <laughs> hey, listen, it is. I'm like... For me to actually be able to pronounce that works out well, because the southern accent, big words, sometimes don't mix well, so I try to mix it up a little bit. That's right. <laughs> a boat is a, that's a, that's a $10 word, isn't it? I, I, you know, I figured, like, I would win. Like, if I put on Jeffrey, like, immediately, they would think I'm smart. Now, whether I am or not, you know, it's just... Right. <laughs> They'd be like, $10 right there. No, I'm kidding. Well, all right. Well, let's, exactly. <laughs> so let's go ahead and jump right into it. So, Austin, tell us, where are you from? I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. Um, right around in this area. Um, uh, around this area. I support the state, but I'm more or less home. And I feel like this is always going to be home. So, that's where I'm rooting this worst thing. Yeah, I could tell you were from Lexington. Couldn't tell. Uh, no, not with that. Not that giveaway. I was going to start saying New York. See if I can get away. But I didn't think so. You're like, I don't know if I can go that far. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Oh, gosh. So, so for you from Lexington, I was like, uh, growing up there, did you play any sports growing up? Uh, so I grew up a, a, like about 20 miles south of here. My hometown was uh, Berea, Kentucky, kind of small town. Um, the group hangout spot was Walmart, of course. So we all, of course, uh, you know, sat in the cars and hung out at Walmart. And then they had this Thomas food market that had the greatest sandwiches on planet Earth. Now, they looked at it sideways going in there, of course, because they didn't fit in. Uh, football, played football for the longest time. Played a little bit of baseball. The only thing that was good baseball was getting hit by the pitch. I would lean into everything just because I'm a little vertically challenged, so I can make the plate real small, so then I just lean and take everything, and eventually they got caught up with that. Uh, but I played football up until my middle school days. Um, I kind of played it more for fun than anything else, so once it became more competition-based, more discipline-based, I kind of moved away from it from there. No, absolutely. I, I definitely agree. Um, I myself love baseball. I still love baseball, but yeah. And I know about all that competition stuff, man. <laughs> yeah, and listen, I literally with football, I just wanted to hit people as hard as humanly possible. And then, you know, it was like, oh, we ended up making kind of a small from there. <laughs> You're like, technique? <laughs> exactly. No, I would just 
Sure. Like, I would be what, like, the CTE nightmare would be, because I just launch my head as hard as humanly possible uh, towards people and just hope for the best. Hey, you know, and sometimes that just works, man. Sometimes that, that's just, that just works. It just works. <laughs> but, uh, so, so, I, so I guess uh, kind of in that um, same vein of thought, um, obviously you wrestle now. Um, have you always loved wrestling? Has that always been something that you've been interested in? Or is that more of a uh, recent passion? Uh, one hundred percent. I think my all of my memories from wrestling. Um, I very great to make a precision. I would come from would be preschool, kindergarten, elementary school. That uh, I'll admit this. We would watch Passion, the soap opera, and then after that, she'd pull out the VHS and let me watch whatever I wanted within reason. Um, you know, I was born in ninety thirty, so kind of during those days when they were going towards that attitude era. So she was more of letting me watch WCW rather than WWF because some of the content might have been a little bit over her head. Or a little bit too adult, um, but she never let me watch everything. I remember my earliest memory. She actually hated Rick Flair with passion. Like, baby face is the only thing there, no matter what she had trust him at all. And I remember that it was all in a VHS, and we watched a lot of them, I'm not sure. Um, the night that Flair came back and that thing to be his tag team partner later in the night, and he was facing uh, Pillman and Arn Anderson. And then, of course, my yes, Gray's yelling at the TV, you know, don't trust them, don't trust them, Steve. Of course, Flair comes out in the middle of the tag, as he tags in, he blasts Sting, all three of them beat the tar out of Sting, and she proceeds, now, mind you, I've never heard her cut in my life, but F this and F that, I told you, Sting, like, I guess because Sting can actually hear her somehow, I'm uh, yelling at the screen and then look at me and tell not to repeat any word that I said. <laughs> you're, you're just like, all right, Granny, all right. Yeah, so, yeah I just, so I, I, I guess I got a hate with Flair, too, and I guess Sting is dumb, you know, I just went with <laughs> You know what, that's right. So... So, obviously, you've been a fan, um, obviously. Wrestling, you know, I think I've talked to, you know, I don't even know how many people during the show, and I think every person I've ever talked to has said, yeah, I watched wrestling when I was a kid. So, I don't think I've ever talked to somebody who hasn't, so that's great. <laughs> but, um, yeah. For so, sure. obviously, you know, those are some good memories of wrestling. Those are some good, I guess, foundations to kind of grow that passion. Um, but tell us about your, your dad, who's a former wrestler. Uh, yeah, so I, it's funny. The, I remember the very first independent show I went to was a company called Mountain Wrestling Association that ran for over 40 years in the central Kentucky area. Um, and my dad was the manager at the time. And I think I was around six or seven. And it happened that night that he got hit over the head with a briefcase. And now me, of course, not having a clue what was going on, balled my eyes out. We took a little break from there. Um, and then he kind of got more back involved when I was around 11 or 12. And from that any show that he was on, I was right there with him. And it was fun how, like, back in the day, so Larry did name for a lot here recently. I remember Larry way back in the day, he's not me, so I was a big curly headed mess. Yeah, yeah, and that's the show, you know, you know, if you want to come get some and that thing, and I was a little bit of a punk, so, you know, I, I understand somebody else. Um, but it was great. Like, I think I grew up with the business, and the business drove me up at the same time. Um, because I was a shy kid. For the most part, I was cool with the people that I was cool with. Uh, but, Wrestling more than anything, I got to project who I am, what I like. And I kind of got to a point where you can take me early um, to the people that support me. I love it. People are not. That's your opinion. That's on you. Uh, but more than anything, it's always been a part of my life one way or another. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, you kind of had that, you kind of had that seed planted for a wrestling kind of along the way. So, obviously, you eventually stopped being a fan and you took a step into the more, I guess you say, professional part of wrestling, um, you became a wrestler. So tell us about when you got trained. What was that like, and um, what was you know, what was like your first match like, for instance? Uh, yeah, I uh, trained with a cool company that I watched. So it's kind of cool to be going to the shows for years and then end up working for the company that, you know, you have been watching. Um, I got trained um, by Dirty Chris Hayes, Jordan Cage, and uh, Max Sled. And I just remember, to a degree, me being close or me being around was a great thing, and in other ways it was bad because, of course, they expected a little bit more out of me. And the training class was a pretty decent class. We still got guys working today, um, but I just – it was kind of weird because when I went into it, I had an expectation of, like, well, I'm going to be low towards the bottom, and, you know, I'm not a big guy by any means, but, you know, I'm going to prove myself in other ways. And it was kind of – within a couple of months, I took the least out of the training a little bit more to leadership program, like, I don't think we can do this. Uh, first match, it was fun because 
I was in the very first I got my initiation, he ain't got to do a top class, so I, of course, wore a t-shirt that night because my chest was some pinkish, purple, bruised mess, kind of looks like, you know, you just took a steak and just beat it over and over again. Um, <laughs> it was a great time. Uh, I wrestled about a quick host and one of the guys that trained me earlier in the night, and then I was a substitution later in the night for a tag title match, and I was not so happy to lucky that I won. So, I mean, in one night, it was kind of very nerve-wracking, inspiring, and crazy all in one way. No, oh, absolutely. So, you know, obviously, you're part of, like, independent wrestling and kind of getting that, you know, step into independent wrestling and getting it, as you said. Uh, it's kind of an interesting um, aspect to, I guess, the company. But just in general, you know, independent wrestling is fantastic. Um, I think you're part of probably one of the greatest eras of independent wrestling, arguably. Um, so having been in independent wrestling for a little bit, um, what would you say is the best and worst parts about the business? A very twofold answer. Um, I guess I'll start with the worst, and I try not to be too much of a negative person. Um, <laughs> sometimes I am I think that we're stuck in the way of how things used to be, per se. Um, as they say, the carny things in wrestling of you have to do things a certain way or you perceive a certain way. Um, it's I feel like things have been involved, and of course, I'm going around and do those things. But it's, we're judging a book by the cover before we even read the chapter, and it's kind of to the point of between that and then like negative fan wise is like I feel like if you enjoy a product, no matter what it is, whether it's Deathmatch, whether it's Japan, whether it's WWE, Impact, Orange, whatever it is, you should do it in And I don't think that because of the mass following or Twitter or Facebook or who all these guys are being on YouTube saying it's awful that you have to think it's awful too. Um, as far as death wise, connection, uh, you know, friendship, fun. I am about to to say that every single person involved in my life right now, I've met big wrestling. Um, as far as the personal friends and everything, like all of my funnest experiences in my life have been through that. And like the bond that you could form of seeing somebody one time, and it may be a month before you see it again, and it's like you can pick up the same conversation that you left off of a month ago without any reference in it, and still be able to continue on. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'd have to agree with that, because like you said, um, unfortunately there's a, a lot of negativity in Russian uh, wrestling just in general, but, um, you know, Independent wrestling, unfortunately, unfortunately petty drama, things of that nature. And, uh, that right. <laughs> but that's, that's part of the reason why, you know, with uh, the Dave show, like you said, we like to be positive or to at least try to be. Um, and Dave's favorite quote of all time is, uh, let's put positivity back. <laughs> and that's one of the hardest things on our studio. So I'm glad that somebody's trying to do it. I, I know it's a very hard journey, but you, you know, one day at a time. Yeah, one day at a time. That's absolutely right. <clears throat> so a little bit more about kind of your career currently, because we've kind of talked about, um, your road to get started wrestling and to kind of uh, get those beginnings um, going, but you've really started hitting your stride. Um, and, I, and it seems like you're like on that brink of, you know, taking the neck up and, you know, moving up another level because you're at a high level, but you're just continuing to break those ceilings and farther and farther up that ladder, if you will. Um, but do you feel like the piece of push this year, because 2019 is upon us, it is January 2nd. Do you think 2019 is going to be a big year for you? I wonder if that, I, and I feel like, if I weren't sitting here and say I don't have confidence in myself, it would never happen. Yeah. Um, this is a lot of up and down, personally, and it kind of can put the highest mountain top, and it can also keep you off the foot of mountain at the same time. Um, but to a degree, I've had sit down with people around me, and I know that my talent is there, and I'm not trying to be selfish at all, but to a degree, I kind of felt plateaued for a while, and I think that's 100% on myself. Um, that I haven't given myself the push and the talent that I think that I am and become that talent. So without a doubt, 2019, I think I am. And I'm willing to go back to whatever show, got passwords set up, tear down, train, whatever you need to make yourself better. Uh, because they focus on just themselves and what they can provide. Feel better too and make their better cross the board. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, a lot of people don't know it, but there's a lot that goes into a uh, wrestling show, and it's a lot of working parts, a lot of movement, and uh, it takes everybody working together to make it a uh, one big functioning mess. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, it's very much like the Brady Bunch in a lot of ways. Like People don't realize that, yes, beyond the wrestlers, beyond the commentators, beyond the ring announcers, even like things like security, if you have one bad apple in the tree, 
it makes everything else fall as well. That's absolutely right. Um, I actually saw like I saw a similar metaphor. If you put a piece of rotting fruit next to other fruit, it's going to make all the fruit bad. So that and I really like it. like apples taste good and bananas are good too. So I mean, like I don't really want to taste like a you know ten week old banana. I'd rather have a fresh. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Good. <laughs> um, yeah. So so a little bit I actually mentioned this in a couple of ways. You actually mentioned this person specifically. Um, I want to dive into that a little bit, but you mentioned that one of the best part of wrestling are the relationships you make, the uh, people that you get to meet, and the connections. Um, but one of those specifically um, is a man named Jordan Cage. Um, he is, uh, from what I understand, your tag team partner in some facet or another, um, who's also a very underappreciated talent in wrestling. And um, what has he meant to your career so far? Obviously, you'd mentioned him before already, so um, must be something there, right? <laughs> Right, 100%. Um, I believe he is one of the people that get to where I am. Um, it's, in a lot of ways, it took underneath his wing and, you know, said, hey, Brad, and Joe with me, here's what's going on. I promise you, I can get you in the door trying to prove yourself in here. Um, and without a doubt, like, I am 100% grateful for all of it. Um, it's kind of crazy to see the journey of, I look like the pictures of Cody Joe of where I was and where I am now. And, like, without a doubt, uh, he's a great success to my career um, and whether that's been just riding on shows or tagging or whatever um, and I think half of the knowledge that he's given me is really provided to the top um, and like, I think here soon we may be exploring seeing what we could both do with singles and like I this tag run over the past almost two or three years has taught me so many things that I didn't even think that was possible to know um, right impossible to grow from and it's absolutely unreal like the amazing journey that we're on and without a doubt he's a great success career. Absolutely. And you know I think we've I believe we've talked to Jordan before and uh, you know I've also seen him wrestle I've seen you wrestle um, I've actually seen you guys wrestle together so it's kind of a, a weird cycle if you think about it but definitely. So I guess to talk a little bit more about you um, you recently kind of another part of the you know, accomplishment, you know, pieces falling together. Uh, you recently won the PTW title and what seems to be uh, quite a little bit of a journey to get there. Um, but what does holding that title mean to you? Here's the crazy thing about it. Um, in the moment, I don't think I realized exactly what it meant until like, kind of a couple of days later. Um, Primetime Wrestling kind of became what's uh, MWA, you know, closed its doors. Probably the rest of it became my home company, and I didn't even kind of realize it at first that it was. Um, but I started way back in the days when we, they were in McVille, and we were looking to draw 20 to 30 people. And I kind of watched the company grow as a whole over a while, and trials and tribulations, losing buildings here and there, and switching it in. And they were always willing to take a risk. Um, they kind of taught me, myself, to be willing to take a risk. And it's crazy that I went from Pre-show matches, they're all the way up to the top of the car. And, like, the journey that it's took to get there has been one wild, wild, crazy ride. And just to see me evolve as a person and as a worker from the beginning days to now is insane. And that company is really producing a little bit of a buzz here. And it's like the stigma behind Kentucky Wrestling for the longest time, with the exception of Roger Ruffin and the NWF, was that it was a small circle, that in that circle was great, but if anybody tried to infiltrate that circle or anybody tried to leave that circle, they weren't going to go anywhere. Um, and PTW has kind of changed the way with bringing guys in. Like, they were willing to go bring guys in, like Myron Reed and Aaron Williams, and guys that traditionally, in, and I, I know there's a big argument about whether Kentucky is considered Midwest or South, and kind of depending on which yours, what your style is, but like, whether we're on that bubble or what it is, they were willing to take a risk bringing in guys that weren't traditionally what this area was about. And the fact that nine times out of ten, I was the guy I put up against them to, like, say, hey, we've got a guy in this area that can work your old style that can go with you all. And then to hear kind words from them afterwards is kind of an amazing feeling. It kind of makes you really feel like you belong. And I feel like winning the belt was kind of the pinnacle of all that. Because um, beyond anything, that happening means this company has belief in you, and like you're their poster child. And like, whether I realize it or not, anywhere in the surrounding areas, I'm a direct reflection of them. So whether it be 
my in-ring work is going to be from that, my character, my everything else from that. Like, I am a direct reflection of the company, and I couldn't be more proud to say that I will represent Primetime Wrestling wherever I go. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what it's all about, that kind of the representation, and, you know, that, that might kind of be one of your home promotions, so it's good to kind of be able to represent them outside and, you know, go to other places and be like, you know, this is who I, this is who I am. Um, exactly. But, exactly. And then I guess to kind of follow up on that, and you actually mentioned um, a little bit about this previously, you know, uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, discussion about uh, different types of styles of wrestling and bringing people in who maybe not have that same style. But you actually have a very interesting hybrid kind of a style, if you like, um, very much an old school s- southern style of wrestling, but with a more of a modern twist. So you're very versatile. You can pretty much get in the ring with anybody and, you know, it would be a great match. So... Did yeah, you, and that's what? what I hang my hat on with that, you know. It's like being able to do that. Absolutely, and that's what I was going to say. I mean, you have such a versatile wrestling style. It, it, like you said, you can go out there with anybody. Um, but did you set out to mix those types of wrestling, or is that kind of natural evolution from your training? Uh, here's the thing. I feel I never wanted to just branch myself to one style. Um, I never wanted to, like, I was never going to be the super athletic type. I can do athletic things, but I can't compare to guys my age and even younger doing things that if I had a trampoline, maybe, um, you know, that might be more possible in that point. But otherwise, I can't do those things. But I felt like I wanted to develop something where whether you put me out there with some guy who's had him in his first match or some guy who's wrestled 20 years, or if you put me in the north, you put me in the south, you put me in the west, it doesn't matter where I am. I can adapt to what the people like, what the people are into, and what the guy I'm facing can work. Um, the, I'm, and I've heard it quite a bit, and I actually like the way you describe it, the old school style with modern twist. But I love all types of wrestling. So I can sit there and watch early high WCW, or I can sit here and watch PWG, or all in, any of those type of events, and try to find a mix. I think, for me personally, while the moves and everything are wonderful, and like I can never go, it's not going to be as innovative as some of the people are. I just get wrapped up in the story because that's always what caught me. Um, and whatever story that's being told, it's it's kind of like I like taking that crowd and it's no cliche thing of taking them on a roller coaster. But I I want them to feel that roller coaster because I want for the two to three hours that they're at the show to forget all their life issues and life problems and realize, hey, we're glad we support this guy. We like this clear cut story and this is what we believe. No, absolutely. And I feel like that's a uh, sort of a lost art in independent wrestling now is, you know, kind of telling a story and uh, having that entering psychology, you know, and kind of getting it down to the basics and being able to project that story. And like you said, kind of take people out of that moment and um, give them something to uh, ignore their real life with, if you will. <laughs> right, right. But definitely, yeah, I 100% agree. Um, having that versatility also just makes you kind of like a hot commodity, if you will, because if you can do anything... Who wouldn't want you? <laughs> exactly. That's the thing. It's like, I want to be that versatile guy, whether it's, hey, we need a laugh, or we need some comedy, or hey, we need fast paced five minutes, or whatever it, whatever role that you need me in, I want to be able to fit in and plug in, no matter what it is. That's absolutely right. So, <clears throat> I guess kind of to follow up on the entire conversation we've had, you know, we've talked about a lot about, you know, the different wrestling styles, and a lot about just your, just your general wrestling, and the, the connections you've made. Um, but recently it seems that there's been a resurgence in independent wrestling, but specifically Midwest wrestling. Uh, and like you said, you know, there is some kind of uh, debate as to whether, you know, Kentucky and all of that's part of the Midwest. Uh, but do you feel like you are re- representing the area you wrestle in? Um, or, and you do help, do you feel like you need maybe have helped pave the way for this area or this region? Uh, cause I feel like we've been building a lot on this region. Um, but do you feel like yeah, you're it, doing it, your part? Well, when I at least attempt to. Like, I will right. never 100% say that I've done enough on my own to pave the way for anybody. Um, and I feel like, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of promise in this area, and it's also oversaturated at the same time. So you do sometimes have to pick through the good and bad, but even through the bad, you see good. And I think this is an area of, more than any that I've noticed, a very young, hungry talent. And I don't even mean young necessarily in age, but just fresh faces. And that's like uh, the new all the league wrestling coming in and everything like that. Like a lot of guys are 
tricking out just because some of your top tier guys like the Indies are going to be gone. And while that's a great spot, and people might see that as a landing spot, I see even more from there. That opens up opportunities for those other companies because you can't deplenish your roster and not have guys ready to step up. But I feel like the Midwest as a whole has such a good crop of time. Like you could send literally anywhere and be represented 100% and shown that whether you think the future is bleak or you think the future is bright, it's going to be bright no matter what because we've got a great group of guys that can go out there and show you what you can do. Nothing. Well, I don't agree. So as we kind of wind down there's, um, with our interviews, we always like to um, kind of take a step away from the wrestling aspect of things and kind of just get to know who we're talking about or talking to. So. Um, I guess the question would be, uh, what does Austin Tyler Morris do in the real world? Do you have like a, uh, like a, I guess you could say hobbies or anything that you do to keep yourself busy when you're not in the ring? Uh, so I am in some ways as exciting as my persona is, is the exact opposite to real life. Um, I, I'm very much, if I'm not at home, I'm in the gym and then I come back home. I'm very avid at Madden, so if anybody wants to play me in Madden, feel free to find me and send me a message. Um, you will either get killed or you'll kill me. There's no in-between. There's no such thing as a close game. Um, but I'm very close-knit. I keep a small group of friends. Um, that's just personal preference to me. I'd rather have a small group that cares about me specifically rather than a large group that just because it's a large group, it is what it is. Um, so without a doubt, I mean, I've got one of the best sporting girlfriends in the world. I've got a family that's in the world of the end. I think a lot of us, in a lot of aspects, see a lot of negativity put on us, but I can 100% say without a doubt that everybody in my life is positive and everything around me is positive. So I try to keep that positivity, whether it's in the gym, whether it's at home, whether it's at a job, whatever it is, I try to spread that as much as I humanly can. Absolutely. I 100% agree. That's the best way to live life. Um, even if you have to keep a, just a group, just a little group of people around you, you know, keeping it positive and keeping it cool, that's how you do it. Um, I guess kind of a side question, kind of once you said, uh, you said you play Madden, uh, what, what's your console of preference? Say that one more time for me, brother. Are you okay? I said, uh, you said you play Madden, uh, what do you play them on? Uh, I'm playing it on the PS4. Um, I'm very much a PS4 guy, uh, but I am not loyal in any way. I went from, uh, Nintendo 64, I had all the way up until the PlayStation 2. So I like the original Xbox and original PlayStation and all those were nothing for me. I got a 360 and religiously played it for years. Um, and then when it came time for a new console, I thought about the one and it's just, I played it uh, with a couple buddies and I, something fell off with me. Even though I've been playing Xbox for a while, so the PS4 became my console choice and I don't see myself going to anything else, but you know what? You never know. <laughs> That's absolutely right. It's I, I always like to ask that just because I always get great answers. People are always like, oh, yeah, PS4 for life. But I like to hear that, yeah, it just kind of evolved into the PS4. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's crazy. Like, I, I, never, I was never a diehard. Like, I was way behind when it came to the console. So, like, I had a 360 up until late 2016. I think it was January of 2017 before I had a before. So, I mean, I was way behind. The fact that I had one, but it's literally for the network, YouTube, Madden, and I'll get the occasional NBA game. So, like, all of these other Red Dead games and everything that I hear great, I always want to try, but I never actually take the time to do it. <laughs> Absolutely, and I understand. Yeah, that's kind of how I was. I had a PlayStation 3 but then, like, in 2000, I think it may have been 2016, actually, or maybe 2015, I finally got an Xbox One. But, yeah, I was super way behind the curve. <laughs> like, years too late. Wait, so, like, the main reason for mine is I switched just because it finally got to the point where they quit coming out with the newer version of games for those systems. And I was like, I was kind of upset playing, like, a four-year-old game. And even right. though I tried to go in and edit things myself, eventually I got tired of it. Right, absolutely. You're just like, man, I can't need, need something new, need something new. Oh, exactly. Man. Well, that's good to hear. You know, glad to hear that, you know, personal life, positivity, Madden, all that good stuff. <laughs> but um, It's a hell of a combo, bro. Yeah, that's exactly right. Positivity in video games, how can you go wrong? 
you, you really can't. Exactly. <laughs> so I guess to kind of um, go back a little bit of wrestling um, as we wrap up a little bit, um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, what it is, how you think 2019 is going to be, you know, a good year. Um, but do you have any, like, specific goals, anything you want to accomplish in 2019? Because, um, like I said, we're at the very beginning, so we have a lot of time. But anything specific that you want to accomplish in the year? Uh, more than anything, I just want new places, new names, fresh faces um, to have that ability to travel because I will sit in my car and I'll drive four hours, eight hours, 12 hours. I'm very much a driving person. Um, so wherever that I feel like I can fit in or a promoter feel like I can fit in, I 100% want to go. And it doesn't – of course, you have the goals of bigger than promotions, but more than anything, I don't want to – maybe more of 2019 to be proven my name itself. And even if that means it's the tail end of the year, next year before I get to that bigger platform or hitting that break or on fire trend, as they call it in the Indies, I more or less want to prove myself to whoever and whenever. Um, Without a doubt, like, I want to show that you can really put me in the ring with anybody 100% with my drive and determination that I feel like we can get a good match no matter what. Yep, absolutely. No, that's, you know, that's how you have to be. You, you can't be afraid to put yourself out there, and like you said, new faces, new places, and that's how you move up. It's 100% how you move up. Yes, sir. Uh, so I guess just kind of a, as a last thing here, you know, um, one huge part of independent wrestling, as I found, is social media. Um, so do you have any social media where fans can follow you, keep up with you, and just kind of keep track of what you're doing in your career? Uh, Facebook's pretty simple. It's uh, Austin Tyler Morris. You'll see me with the PTW belt on that one. Um, Twitter is the AT Morris, and then Instagram I'm on there as well. Um, my pictures aren't quite the new lingo on fleek, but I'm trying my best. Uh, that one is at the underscore AT Morris, because, of course, someone had to take it because I couldn't have the same thing across two boards. But, you know, that's for another day. Uh, but feel free to follow me on social media. I'm pretty interactive, uh, more so on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Facebook is kind of being more professional. I know everything instead of just a mix of personal. Um, with that, it's more show flyers and anything like that. And then, of course, I had to go in there to see the drama because that's what the king of Facebook is all about. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, you know, no judge, but I'm pretty sure on fleek is like a 2016 term. So we'll let's slide this time, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I kid, I kid. You've heard him here on the Dave Dynasty Show as a guest and as host of the monthly Graham's Gallery episodes. And now you can hear his stories. You can own a copy of Confessions of a Big Time Wrestler. The audio book from Dr. Jerry Graham Jr., former multi-tag team champion in WWA and owner of Bruiser Bedlam. You can hear all of his encounters with the various wrestlers, places, and promotions he's worked as he tells about his colorful, long, and illustrious career. You can have your own copy for only $25, and that includes shipping and handling. It's very simple. Go on Facebook, look up Jerry Jaffe, J-A-F-F-E, send him a private message, and make arrangements to purchase a copy of Confessions of a Big Time Wrestler now. You will not regret this purchase. All right, thank you for joining us this week. We hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, special thanks to George Shire for joining us to talk about the life and times and career of Gene Okerlund uh, and remembering him. Uh, in his passing then it's also a special thanks Austin Tyler Morris uh, one of the great young stars in professional wrestling uh, for joining us for that interview uh, please make sure that wherever you get your podcast and wherever you're listening to the Dave Dynasty show that you subscribe and then leave us a review there if you use iTunes uh, please rate and review us there uh, whatever platform and we're available on all the podcast platforms make sure you subscribe to us as we drop these episodes as we share them on social media uh, make sure you share them uh, help spread the word. Let's help network out, uh, get people talking about Midwest pro wrestling, uh, and give it some attention that it deserves. We appreciate your help in spreading the word. Speaking of social media, make sure you follow us on all platforms. Uh, you can go to DaveDynasty.com. There are links there for everything. We're on uh, Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We have a great YouTube channel. All kinds of pro wrestling stuff there. 
make sure you subscribe to that. Uh, speaking of DayDynasty.com, we did a little bit of an overhaul on it here recently. Uh, kind of a redesign, upgraded, up, up, excuse me, updated the looks a little uh, and the graphics. So go check that out. Go to DayDynasty.com. That is your central hub uh, for everything we do. And uh, while you're there, uh, there are ways that you can support the show. Uh, and there are links and, and banners and everything there on the website to, to do that. Uh, one of the first ways, or probably the best way, is go to ProWrestlingTees.com slash The Dave Dynasty and buy one of our shirts. Uh, we have four shirts available. Uh, they're all very cool. And uh, then you're helping us. You're helping support the show. Plus, you get something for yourself. If you go to DaveDynasty.com, at the top, there's a link to go to Pro Wrestling Tees. And the other way you could do it is just to make financial contributions to the show. You can go to PayPal.me slash The Dave Dynasty and make a one-time contribution. Or you can go to patreon.com slash the Dave Dynasty and make ongoing monthly contributions. Anything helps, even if it's a couple bucks. Anything you guys do to support us goes right back into the show. and helps keep us rolling, helps keep the show free and full of all the Midwest pro wrestling goodness that you like every week. So make sure uh, to, to, to be charitable and help us out uh, as we do the show. Again, we're not looking to get rich. We're just looking to spread the word. Everything that you can uh, contribute to the show goes right back to it. We've got a lot of great episodes coming up for you. I keep talking about the Midwest Year End Awards for 2018 with Andy from the Road Home from Wrestling and Chad from MidwestTerritory.com. I swear to you it's coming. Uh, this is on me. Uh, just everything's been hectic and crazy and scheduling-wise has been just nuts. We will have that to you within the next couple weeks. Uh, we'll talk all about 2018, do some awards. It'll be a great episode. I promise you it's coming. And also coming up 2019, we'll have... Uh, all of the favorite episodes that you come to expect from the Dave Dynasty Show, Graham's Galleries, uh, history episodes talking about the WWA, Detroit, AWA, specific wrestlers, specific events, uh, all this stuff from Midwest Pro Wrestling. And plus, we'll have all the interviews you that you come to love with legends and new talent and young stars. Um, they'll all be, be, all be here in 2019, and uh, it's going to be a great year. We're also looking to get out there more, uh, make some appearances uh, be at some shows and things and, and, and kind of be seen a little more. So if you see us out in the event, make sure you come up and say hi, take a selfie, post it on social media uh, and tag us. That will be cool. We appreciate that. Woo. That's it for today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for everybody that took part in the show. Thank you to Ike Isaacs for everything he does for the show. Uh, guys, thank you for all your support. Let's make this a great 2019 in everything that we do. And as we like to say here, let's help spread some positivity, make this world a little better place. So until next week, ladies and gentlemen, be good, be safe, and keep on growing. <laughs>